Let's read the paragraph. That's on page 21, the bottom paragraph. Zubudi, what do you think? If someone filled the universe with the seven treasures and gave all away in his practice of dana, would this good cause enable the giver to gain a great merit? So the Buddha asked Supudi a question. If someone would be so generous as to give out quantity of help as valuable as the seven treasures, treasures so much that they fill the universe, so many treasures, would that person have a lot of merit? So that's an analogy saying that if someone give and give and give so much, similar to giving treasures that could fill up the whole universe, to give, to help, to donate for charity purposes, would the, such merit be great? So this is the question. Uh, the Buddha raised that question, has a, he, he had the reason to raise this question. Um, what are the seven treasures? The seven treasures, the seven treasures according to the sutra, it's gold, silver, crystal, agate, carnelian, coral, and amber. In the Chinese language, in the Chinese languages, jin, yin, liu li, che qu, ma lao, san hu, hu bai. Uh, the seven treasures. These are the treasures. These are very valuable treasures. It's just like giving money, which is so valuable, a lot of money to help the poor. Um, in the sutra, the, men, the Buddha mentioned a few times an offering of the seven treasures, giving an analogy, giving out treasures. In chapter 8, he says, making an offering of the seven treasures does not compare with seeing one's nature. In other words, even if you give out the seven treasures as much as treasures that can fill up the whole universe, the merit so obtained will not be as great as when you can see your own real nature in chapter 8. It's not comparable. You see your own real nature, that merit is even more than giving immeasurable treasures to help to give out. Why? We already explained that. Of course, first comments, you may not know about it because we already have covered chapter 8. So, and also in chapter 11, the Buddha also says that making an offering of the seven treasures does not compare with knowing this sutra, which means that if you really understand and know this sutra and practice according to the sutra, it's as valuable, it's as meritorious as giving out the seven treasures to help. Now, and in this chapter, he says, making an offering of the seven treasures does not compare with detachment from form. Because attachment to form creates a karmic seed that can never produce a non-karmic fruit. Um, if, you, if you detach from form, now, of course, you know what is detached from form. If you detach from form, the merit so obtained is even higher than giving out seven treasures as charity, treasures as much as filling the whole universe. Why did the Buddha always mention charity? Why did the, mention, why did the Buddha in, in the sutra always cite cited charity as, as, a, for, as a, for, you know, a forefront practice? Because in the six paramitas, remember the six prajna paramitas? The first one is charity, or generosity, and it's in a Sanskrit language, is dana, charity, morality, morality, keeping your, your precepts, conforming to the precepts, endurance, the third one is endurance, morality is of course conforming to precepts, um, charity, morality, morality uh, in endurance, diligence, meditation, and wisdom, or prajna. Now, these are the six paramitas. Uh, and, charity is, and charity is the foremost of the practices because charity is easy to do. I think, I think charity is easier than to, to do than the other five. 
Endurance is difficult. Morality is difficult. Diligence, meditation, and prajna is difficult. Charity, it's, I think, is the easiest of the six, but it's not the least um, unimportant, not the least insignificant. It's as important as, as all the other parameters. It is relatively, relatively easier to, to practice giving, and it is as important as all the others. So that's why the, the Buddha always give an example of charity when you compare uh, certain philosophy with, with the six parts of parameters. Now the next paragraph, we, uh, I think today we would like to finish section, section 19, so let's get to the next paragraph. The next paragraph will be on the next page, on page 22. And it said, yes, well honor one. Because of this good cause, the giver would gain the great merit. Uh, well honor one is Bhagavad, Bhagavad day, Bhagavad day. Well honor one in the Chinese language is Si Juan Bhagavad day. Oh, well honor one. Because of this good cause, the giver would gain the great merit. Uh, of course, the giver, very generous. Uh, would have a lot of merits obtaining from giving. Next, Zubuti, if the merit were real, the Tathagata would not say it was great. He said so because there is no merit. It seems paradoxical, but it isn't. While an offering of the seven treasures is great, no matter how immeasurable and, uh, the merit might be, it is still empty. Uh, such merit does not include liberation, um, either, either liberation of our own or that of others. Thus the Buddha said such merit is not real, um, as such merit would, en would enrich only your next incarnation. Assuming you don't get enlightened and, and you don't detach yourself, you, you don't transcend life and death, you don't, you don't transcend samsara in this lifetime, you still have to reincarnate in your next life. But if you have done a lot of merits in helping, you've done a lot of giving, in the next life, it will enrich your next life only. It will, it will not liberate you. In other words, you carry your good karma, your meritorious karma, into the next life. But you still don't get liberation. You still carry on with your samsara, your life and death. That's why the Buddha said, this merit is not real merit. Merit. It only enriches your next life. It doesn't include liberation. For all those people who are extremely rich now, billionaires, they didn't become billionaires without a reason. They have done a lot of giving in their last life. Not just their last life, their previous lives. They have done a lot of giving, a lot of charity. And because of that cause, when they come back again, they become billionaires. Not just because of this lifetime. And some people are extremely poor. Why? There's reason for it. Nothing comes without a reason. They didn't give in their last life. They were so frugal and they were so uh, postimonious. They don't want to give out a penny. They're, they're misers. They're people who have a lot of money and they don't want to give. They're so egoistic. Now, if in your previous life or lifetime, you didn't give anything, you didn't help, you, rein, you go into reincarnation, you carry that karmic force. When you come to this life, you're penniless. You could be born in an undeveloped country where you don't even have food. You suffer from starvation. And how come there are differences? Some people go, some people, there's a saying in the Chinese, in the, in the Chinese proverb. There are people who were born with a ghost golden spoon. The people who were born with, none, with nothing. Not even a piece of cloth. In some underdeveloped countries, they don't even have a piece of cloth. So, why? 
There are causality for all these. Everything has a reason. Has <laughs> everything is cause and effect, cause and effect. Don't blame the universe for it. Don't blame others uh, for your lot. You cultivate your lot with your own hands. You did it. You you responsible for it, not God. You. We are responsible for our actions. We are responsible for our karma, not God. Don't blame God. Um, by the way, we already have touched on this topic. There are gods, billions of gods, but but gods still have to go through reincarnation. You have to go beyond God. You got to transcend God. How? Here is the Buddha's teaching. So why does merit, assuming um, if you are attached to merit, you still stay within the realm of the fallacious four conception: ego, personality, beings, and lifespan, or ego, personality, being, and continuity. Now that. The fallacious concept, you know, you know, we, we we already have talked about it in the previous chapters. Why is merit not real? If something is real, why is merit not real? The Buddha said. The Buddha said what? There is no merit. That means because merit is not real. Why is merit not real? If something is real, it should not be limited by time. By space or by conceptual dimensions, this is the the Buddhist definition of reality. If it transcends time, transcends space, and transcends conceptual dimensions, is approaching to reality. And sometimes we call it the Dhammakaya. So the Buddha speaks of merit from the point of view of form and practices before before we attain Nirvana. Although merit. Is not real. Merit is not real, but it supports through it supports true realization. So the the Buddha speaks of merit as merit. It does not mean that oh merit is not real, so I don't need to do any charity, because charity would give merit which is unreal. So I don't do any charity. Oh, you got it all wrong. You have to do charity. You must do charity, but you don't attach to it. The Buddha speaks of such merit as great, because greatness or smallness relates only to form, and form has no reality; it is force. If donors detach from form in their practice of charity, and do not consider merit to be real, this is not force. If donors attach to a subject or object and think that the merit is real, this is force. You see the difference. If you do your charity, you don't attach to merit. It is not force. If you do your charity, you attach to the merit. Then that's force. So it's a matter of attachment or non-attachment. And um, when you transcend form, you don't have any attachment. When you don't have attachment, your ego is gone. When your ego is gone, the prison of your ego wall has collapsed. You see the whole vista of the horizon of space. But when you are surrounded by your ego prison, you don't see anything. You are in that cell. You are in that jail. You are in that ego prison. We can't get out. Section twenty. Supudi, what do you think? Can the Buddha be perceived by his completely perfect physical body, a rupakaya? Next paragraph. No, well, Anna one, the Dharagatta should not be so perceived. Why? Because the Buddha says the completely perfect rupakaya is not, but is called the completely perfect rupakaya. Supudi, what do you think? Can Dharagatta be perceived by his completely perfect form? No, well, honor one. The Dharagatta should not be so perceived because the Dharagatta sets 
the completely perfect form are not, but are called completely perfect form. They're not real form, but they are called form. Isn't paradoxical? It isn't. You must understand it. According to sutras, the Buddha possesses three bodies, which are actually essentially one, but we can say there's three bodies. One is Dhammakaya, the other is Sambhogakaya, and the other is Nirmanakaya. Dhammakaya in the Chinese language is Qing Jing Fa Shen. Sambhogakaya, Yuan Man Bao Shen. Nirmanakaya, Qian Bai Yi Fa Shen. The Buddha has three bodies. Isn't it strange? What is a Dhammakaya? The Dhammakaya is the Dharma body as opposed to the physical body of the Buddha. It is formless, penetrating all existence, shining everywhere and enlightening all. According to the general Mahayana, this is the reality body, the true body or the true mind or absolute existence, however you want to call it. Or oh, that is your last time I talk about originality enlightenment, original nature. We have that nature. That nature of becoming the Buddha, that Buddha nature, that is the Dhammakaya. That Dhammakaya is formless. And the next is Zambhogakaya. I'm just refreshing your memory. I have already talked about this, but in order to explain the physical body, the, can we perceive the Buddha by his physical body and his gracious appearance? Some people attach the gracious appearance. Now, the Dhammakaya you cannot see. Um, the Sambhogakaya, that's the reward body of the Buddha. The ideal body of a Buddha, which is produced from entering Buddhahood as a result of vows taken during the practices in the Buddhasattva path. Now, this body can only be perceived by Bodhisattvas. We cannot see them. We cannot see the Buddha's Sambhogakaya because our level is not high enough. We cannot see the Sambhogakaya, only Bodhisattvas. Only the Bodhisattvas in the ten Bhumis, a higher level Bodhisattva can see, we couldn't see. We, we're not capable of seeing. The third is Nimanakaya. This is the body we see. This is the body of transformation by which he appears in any form seen by sentient beings. Now, historically, Buddha Sakyamuni was born in India 2,600 years ago. He was a prince, and later he um, abandoned all his luxuries and desires and became an ascetic, and then he became a monk, and he obtained nirvana. And he appeared as a man. Now that is the Nirmanakaya. In appearance, we can see them actually in the history of mankind. Now that is the Nirmanakaya of the Buddha. Now the Nirmanakaya of the Buddha contains 32 meritorious attributes and 80 minor characteristics. 32 meritorious attributes. Of course, the sutras mentions in detail this 32 meritorious attributes and 80 minor characteristics. It's all detailed in sutras, particularly in a sutra called Abhini Sramana Sutra. It's the most comprehensive Buddha biography in the Chinese Buddhist canon. There's a translation by S. Beal, B-E-A-L, Professor S. Beal. He translated that 100 years ago. He translated that Abhini Sramana Sutra and in, in which there's a, a detailed description of the 32 meritorious attributes and, um, and 80 uh, minor characteristics. For example, um, just off the top of my head, I can think about is uh, the Buddha has 32 attributes, fingernails of, of, of bright, of, of, of copper color and well-developed, smooth fingernails and concealed ankles, even feet, tender, pure, round body, well-proportioned, well broad and graceful limbs and all that. 32 with limbs longer than, you know, when you stretch limbs, it's longer that you can reach the ankles, the, the knees. Um, 32 altogether, you can go into detail of that. 
uh, about that. The appearance of the Buddha as seen by sentient beings is the Nirmana Kaya body. That is his incarnated or apparition uh, body in which he appeared in order to teach the beings of the world. Such body was now long cremated and was just it was just an incarnation. This is not the true body. So you cannot attach to the form. If you attach to form, you attach to appearance, you cannot transcend form. So the Buddha wanted to remind Supati that the Dhammakaya has no form. The Dhammakaya, has, it transcends forms, it transcends appearances. Uh, why do we have to transcend form? The Buddha is teaching us to detach from form, teaching us to detach from ego. He's giving a lot of examples. Um, Dhammakaya is all powerful. If I can give an example of space, space has no form, but it absorbs all form, it takes in all forms. All form exists in space, but space itself is formless. You have a box and you say, this is, if there's nothing in the box, you, you say, that is space in the box. Yes, only when you have a box, you have space. And the box is within all those four levels, all those four woods, you call it box. Um, if we see the Buddha in his form, we do not see the real Buddha. How can you see the formness from the form? If we attach to form, we have built up in our mind, in our mind, the fallacious fourfold notions again. The ego, the personality, beings, and lifespan. So in order to finalize this, which I already have up to section 20, next time I'm going to start on 21. Um, Let's raise two questions. Can we see the real nature from form? Can we see real nature from form? The answer, um, the answer is no. If you attach to the notion of form, you cannot see the real nature of form. So you cannot see the real nature from form because you attach to form. So the answer is no, you cannot see real nature from form. But the answer is also yes. If you do not attach to the notion of form, you see the real nature from form. Remember, this, the, remember the, uh, the Heart Sutra set? And I read it out to you. Oh, Saraputra, form is no different than emptiness. Emptiness is no different than form. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is a form. The same is true with perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. So we always have been chanting the Heart Sutra. It summarizes what is what it says in here. So that the Heart Sutra is it, it summarizes a lot of philosophy in there. But every word contains a lot of deep meaning into it. That word emptiness. You can talk about it for years, about that, just that word emptiness, sunyata. How come form is no different than emptiness, and emptiness is no different from form? How come form is emptiness, and emptiness is form? How come it is the same with perception, conception, volition, and consciousness? What's the meaning of conception, perception, volition, and consciousness? And then it says, therefore in emptiness there is no form, no perception, no conception, no volition, no consciousness. There's no eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind. I have eye, ear, nose, body, and mind. And it says, you have no eye, no, e no eye, ear, no nose, tongue, body of mind, no form, sound, smell, taste, touch, or object of mind. A lot of negation. How come there's a lot of negation? There's a lot of negation. There's also a lot of affirmation. So, the sutra appears as paradoxical, but then it gives you the negation and the affirmation. So we really have to study a lot into it. Um, it's, 
the profundity of the of, of the of the Buddhist philosophy requires us to to deal more into it by comparison to actual life, by our life. Um, only by comparison, by experiencing our life, can we actually see the philosophy of Buddhism. Don't just stick to the words. <laughs>